بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء. كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم وإن الفجار لفي جحيم يصلونها يوم الدين وما هم عنها And brothers and sisters who are listening, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's always nice to come back here to your masjid, beautiful masjid. May Allah Azza wa Jal increase it in barakah, increase it in the musallis that come here, increase it. Say Amin. We don't need the barakah. We need the barakah in the masjid. We need Allah Azza wa to give us the pure hearts for the masjid so that we are the best individuals in the, in the society. May Allah Azza wa make all of you, all of us, uh, of those people. Amen. Amen. The topic here is about the fact that we need to ask Allah Azza wa Jal, we need to ask God some questions. Now, some of you might be surprised with the topic title. Because it's kind of restrained. We don't normally see a title like that. I mean, who, who does a masjid bayan and has a title? We need some answers from God. Right? Who, who, who puts a title like that? Now, the, re the, the, the brothers in the masjid they actually asked me to, to, support, uh, to propose a title. And after thinking about different things, I actually proposed this myself. The title is from me. And there's a reason for this. Normally, during this period of time, you know, the, the youth, alhamdulillah, they're here today and they're going to listen to this. There's many that will listen to this, inshallah, in the recording afterwards. Normally, you come to the masjid and the kind of things you'll hear around this kind of Christmas period, you'll hear is about Jesus and Isa, alayhi salam. You'll hear about, you know, our aqeed and belief about that. Sometimes you'll have things brought directly to the youth, which is about drugs, which is about the gang culture, which is about other things, okay? Many things, uh, you know, it could be about them chasing girls, chasing money and chasing the world. We have those bayans, and those bayans are all necessary. There's one type of bayan that is not done, usually not done. And that is something to do with the, with the big uh, problem we have today. And that problem is that we have got a massive, amount of youth that are turning away from Islam or, or are about to turn away from Islam or there's many of them who have already turned away from Islam from within their minds the only thing left now is the Muslim name the Muslim name and that they belong in a Muslim family and that they do believe in the Quran they believe in the Quran they sometimes will come rarely, you know, sometimes they'll come to the masjid like on Eid day or, you know, maybe the odd Jum'ah somewhere. They might sometimes, you know, go and associate themselves with religious people, but most of the time there's not, no religion left in their lives, okay? And I'm telling you one thing, okay, we get quite happy with, Alhamdulillah, I think it's really good that we've got a lot of youngsters come to the masjid. But I want to tell you one thing is that, Let's be honest with ourselves, there are there's so many, there's so many youth that are not coming to our masjids, that are not with us, uh, we haven't reached out to them, and they've got doubts in their minds. And the doubts that are in their minds, some of them come naturally, some of them come because of their, because of their religious studies in their schools, uh, religious education in schools, some of it is given to them by their friends, and some of it they, they have just heard 
uh, from someone maybe who's close to them at some point in their life and these doubts start to creep in and the doubts don't go away, they, they grow, okay? So we're here to now discuss this, this issue because it's a big thing. I don't know whether you, you know what it, what it is or not, but it's a big thing. And, I, and, and recently, uh, you need to know this, that uh, a survey was done of the religious educational teachers in this country. And do you know that 80% of the religious education teachers in this country teaching in the secondary schools are, are, are not, not only non-Muslims, they're actually atheists. 80% of them are atheists. If you have in a religious educational, you know, as a religious education teacher, if you have a Christian, the Christian will no doubt talk about his Christian. When it comes to Christianity, he'll talk about it with passion. Yes or no? Guys, yes or no? You know, he's gonna teach you atheism, he'll teach you Islam, he'll teach you Hinduism. He'll teach you Sikhism, he'll teach you Judaism, and when it comes to uh, Christianity, he'll talk about that with passion. The Muslim teacher will be more passionate about Islam as a religious education teacher. The Hindu teacher will be more passionate about Hinduism. The atheist will be more passionate about no religion. Do you understand? You know, Qurbani, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, you take the goat to the Qurbani, Allah Akbar, that's his job. It's like all religion out the window. Their way, their way of teaching is that, give me the proof that God exists. What's the proof that God exists? And these are the questions that we put into their minds. Questions like, you know, I'm going to come to these questions one by one. Uh, not all of them, I can't cover all the questions. But I want to, I want, I want to um, start, start with you. Imagine there's a youngster and he's asking these questions. These are his questions. I'm going to go through question by question. And I'm going to try and give you the answers from the Quran because these, these answers are in the Quran. But because people haven't read the Quran, because people don't know where to look in the Quran, they don't know the answers. And I'll tell you one thing. You will never come with a question about Allah, but Allah has already answered it in the Quran. There's not a single question you will ever come but I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give you the, the best one, okay? I'll, I'll, before I go to the best one, I, can give you, I want to tell you my own story. I, um, you know, I, I, I went to madrasa. I studied a few madrasas. I studied for about nine years. I graduated, you know, with, with the, the, with the <coughs> things that I, that I know today, okay? In, in boarding schools I went. I became an imam. Now imagine this, okay? I want, I want you to understand this. In nine years, nine years, I was in... <coughs> A madrasa, okay, so I, I was in three different madrasas over nine years. And I had I was I was learning literally six days a week, six to eight hours of lessons a day, and I was studying all the time about Islam. Now imagine after nine years I come out, okay? Nine years I come out. I'm an imam of a masjid in North London. And after about uh, about five or six years after I finished, I graduated. One day, uh, I had an interview uh, in central London in, in ITV news, uh, sorry, ITV uh, studio. Okay, there, there, uh, there was a debate between a Christian, a, Jew, a Jewish, Jewish rabbi, a Christian priest, myself, and uh, Melvin Bragg. What was the? I think his name is Melvin Bragg. I think he was, he was the, uh, the the host of the of the show. So anyway, the thing was, it wasn't about the show. It was the journey that I had to, to the, to, to, from the studio back to my house. So they paid for a taxi journey from my house to the studio and they paid for a taxi journey from the studio back to my house. So I went on my way from taxi, on the way it was fine, on the way back, imagine this, on the way back it was a black cab, black taxi, you know, I, I don't pay for this kind of stuff, okay? So I'm at the back and the driver, I'm trying to give him down. Because whenever I get the opportunity to give dawah, I'll give some dawah. So I'm trying to call him to Islam. By the time, now this guy, subhanAllah, I have to say here, this guy knew how to, he knew the art of debate. And he had gone through critical thinking. And he had studied philosophy. And he was really good at it. And he was talking to me and I'm talking to him. The journey is about one hour. 
I have to tell you, after one hour, my iman was shaking. As an imam, okay? As an imam, I want you to understand this. And you might think, stop for Allah, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, nine years of studying Islam, studying Quran, studying Tafsir, studying Hadith, studying all of that, and this person had my iman shaking because I was thinking, I didn't have the answers to give to him. Now, what you've got to understand, why am I telling you this? I'll tell you why I'm telling you this. Is because you know these, these youngsters here who go to college and university, one thing I have to say to you, don't you ever let them go and take the, 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 the subject of philosophy. Don't do that. Unless the teacher who's going to teach is a Muslim. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? You guys, how, how, I think I've lost half of you. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? I want to hear you because otherwise you can go to sleep. I tell you what happened. I came out from the taxi and I was like, whoa, what was that? Because everything I asked him, he gave me an answer. I asked, said something else, he gave me another answer. What I, hadn't, what I hadn't studied was philosophy. I had studied some logic and some other things, but not philosophy. So then I went to a Muslim philosophy teacher. And I studied philosophy under him for two years. <clears throat> And then I became a teacher of religious philosophy. And I taught that for about five to six years. And then I thought, now come. I'm ready for you. I'm ready for you. Because the thing is, you can study the religion, but philosophy is a different subject. And philosophy, you know, you, you, if, you know how, you know, if you know how philosophy works, if you know how these, these really complicated questions work, they can make you like freeze. You don't, they can make you believe that that door is a window. And they can make you believe that the window is a door. It depends how, how good you are in the art of debate. If you know critical thinking, if you know how to use the art of debate, you can do whatever you want. And I, I, I tell you, you know, some, some of the best people uh, you know, of this, of this Muhammad are there in Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Fespas, Fespas, you know Fespas? You know Fespas? The people who are like so conniving, so cunning. You say this, they say that. You say, oh, what is I said this, he said that. I mean this, he made me think that. And they'll get you like this, like that, like that. Next minute, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, this guy, whoa, whoa, whoa. he's better than Tony Blair. You know what I'm saying? And that's what it will do. And in fact, not Tony Blair, he was actually, he, he was one of the best in NLP. If you know what NLP is, NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. I don't want to. I don't want to lose you guys here because you're going yalla. You think he's a tall guy? You're going to think what kind of space are these? We never heard. NLP, neuro linguistic programming. Again, it uses the same thing. It's the art of how you speak, and they teach you how to speak and convince another person just through your speech. Okay. I first came across this about 20 years ago. Somebody from my crowd, from my audience like you, gave me a book. He said, you should read this. I read it, I was amazed by this. And then later on I found out that Tony Blair was a, one of the masters of NLP. That's why in 12 years when he was a prime minister in this country, when he was in the parliament, people couldn't argue with him because he knew how to debate. Once you learn the art of debate, you can take on a lot of people. You can take on a lot of people and convince them with whatever you want. So now, after two years of studying with this Muslim teacher, I understood what it was in SubhanAllah. Then I found an ayah of the Quran, which summarized all of philosophy in one ayah. And it smashed all the arguments in one ayah. One, one ayah. Whole, whole of philosophy. Now let me show you, uh, let, me, let me tell you about the, the, the verse. So this is in the uh, 27th juz of the Quran. So Surah 53, Surah Najm, Ayah number 28. Allah says, They don't have true knowledge. They don't have the real, true knowledge. Whatever they are pursuing, whatever they're following, they're following their own 
guesses, they're guessing. They're following conjecture. They're following, they're following things that they've got thought in their minds. Run means thought in their minds. And then Allah says, وَإِنَّ لَا يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا Just because you thought of something, just because you've got a concept in your mind, just because you think you know something, doesn't mean that that thing is actually as you think it to be. Do you guys understand that or not? Yeah. If I sit down and I sit down here and I say, what, I, I say, what color is your door? Can I ask you, what color is your front door? What color is your front door? Go on, what color is your front door? You don't know. <laughs> white. If I say to you your front door is not white and I say to you it's black, are you going to believe me? No. No, let's say I'm convinced. <coughs> I don't believe you. I think that your front door is, is, is black, it's not white. Now you're going to say to me, well, prove it, right? Have you seen my door? Well, no, I haven't. But I know it's going to be black. I know it. I'm, I'm completely convinced it is black. Just because I thought of it doesn't mean that your, your door is, is white. Just because I speak about it doesn't make your door bl you know, black. Or whatever. It's white, it's white. It doesn't make it black. Now, what they did is they made all these thoughts about God, whether God exists, whether he doesn't exist, whether this, whether that, and all these thoughts. Oh, if God is there, then, then this is the question, okay? If God is there, then he is, if he's there, okay, I get, get, get a hold of this. These are philosophical questions. I don't want to lose you. I'm going to make you slowly understand this and move along with me. They said, is God merciful? Is the most merciful? Is he the most merciful? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Is he the most powerful? Yes or no? Yes. So then they put the two things together. They said, if he's the most merciful, so he has mercy, he has unlimited mercy. And if he's the most powerful, so he has unlimited power then the problems that we see on the earth, either it means that he is, he hasn't got the mercy while he watches the people on the earth suffering, he hasn't got no mercy for them, or he hasn't got the power to stop their suffering. Do you guys understand? Yeah. So either he hasn't got the mercy, so therefore he, he doesn't care about them, or he doesn't have the power to stop them, therefore he's weak. Now do we learn that? Say now do we learn that? And the answer to that is so simple. Kitab buzlo or kitab What do you do? Answer is very simple. You know, you know when you know when a son in a, in a in a house, okay, there's a son in the house and he's messing around. You guys know this about this in Islam that you know I'm talking about, yeah. You know, son in the house, he's messing about. So he's not studying properly. He's, he's going out whenever he likes. He comes back when he wants to come back. He like, hum, 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 hum. you know, like he thinks he's, he thinks he's like, you know, Godzilla in the house. He thinks he runs the house, okay? But his dad pays for everything. His dad, his dad pays for the mortgage. His dad pays for all the bills. His dad pays for the hot shower that he has. His dad bought the mattress that he's sleeping on at the night time, right? His dad provides all the food in the house. He eats that, al mattress from Gumaya, he sleeps on the mattress and he has the hot shower, he wears his designer clothes and says, hum, 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 whoa, whoa, what should I listen to for whoa, whoa? Do, do you guys understand? Yeah? So so what happens one day yeah, is that the dad has enough. The dad has enough. And the dad says, okay. I school tomorrow buzzer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you a lesson. So mom's like, nah, 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 please, please, nah, 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 nah. There is no more, <laughs> no, that's it. Dad says, nah, that's it. I'm gonna kick him out the house. He's 24 years old. He doesn't even know how to wear his trousers. He doesn't know how to tie his shoelaces. When he drives, he drives as if he owns the road. I'm gonna go and bail him out from the police station. I've got to watch out from the, from the others that are looking for his drugs in my house. Yeah, I've had enough, I'm going to kick him out. So he says, that's it. So he kicks his son out. He says, go out there, go and earn your own money, get your own place, rent your own you know, apartment, go and get your own food, own mattress, own, pay your own bills, and then we'll see you know, uh, 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 where your attitude goes. And then mom begging, saying, no, I said, no. Today is the day, so he cooks, kicks him out. So his, his kid goes out there, first day, you know what the kids do? They go to Ogurgore Abdin, in this friend's house one day, 
that friend's house another week, this friend's house two weeks. How long is your friend gonna keep you, bro? <laughs> They're gonna say, hey, what the fuck, I'm gonna die anyway. But do you mean I mean? You haven't got a home to go to, get out of here. I can't keep you for more than two weeks, man. So eventually he has to go out and work. Now the guy basically, he can't eat three meals a day. He has to only eat one meal a day. His dad's watching him. His dad knows he's eating one meal a day. His dad knows that he's living, he's living rough. He does, his dad knows eventually that his son gets an apartment and he has to pay a huge bill. He's taking loan off his friends. He's trying to make something happen. He doesn't have a proper mattress. He sleeps on the floor for so many days. He's in freezing cold. He's suffering. Now you tell me. I'm going to ask you a question. Does his dad not have the power to bring his son back into the house? Yes or no? He has the power. Does his dad love him? Yes or no? Yes. Come on, come on. Let me ask you once more. Does his dad love him? Yes or no? Yes. yes. The kids, some little kids there said no, but most of you said yes. Only grown up adults said yes. Okay? His dad loves him. Loved him to bits. But if his dad doesn't do this to him today, tomorrow this kid is going to ruin everything. He's going to ruin his own life. The dad has full mercy and the dad has, you know, for his son, I'm saying, and the dad has full power to bring his son back, but his dad wants to teach him a lesson. Okay? He wants him to, to now, now sometimes it's not because of teaching a lesson. Let me give another serious. Some, some, some of you might say, well, that's a horrible example to use because is God horrible? No, no. No, let me give you another example. When, when someone is, 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 is uh, given to a boarding school, like I went to a boarding school. I went to a boarding school for nine years, okay? My dad sent me there. I didn't like it at first. Later on, I liked, I liked it. The food wasn't always nice, okay? The stay wasn't always nice. I went through nine years of study in boarding schools. I never saw my family except for every three months. I came and saw them for one week, then I was back in the boarding school again, okay? It wasn't easy, it was tough. Did my dad love me, yes or no? Yes. Did my dad have the power to take me back to the house, yes or no? Yes. But what did he do? He did the best thing for me. When I went through my training, then it made me the person who I am. People send their kids to the armies for, for training, to boot camps and other things. It makes them better human beings, okay? Now let's get back to the subject. Back to the subject is Allah Azza wa Jalla has got the full mercy to do whatever He wants. Allah Azza wa Jalla has got the full power to do whatever He wants, but He has His hikmah, his re He has His wisdom, His reasoning of why He does it. And all will be revealed on the Day of Judgment. Now, let me go through some of the questions that these kids have got in their minds. So imagine a, a young person is asking these questions, okay? okay? A young person, he asks the question, he says, well, you know, Who's God? Who is God? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the whole Quran. Okay, this is in the 16th juz of the Quran. <coughs> Allah says, Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budni. Allah says, I am Allah, there is no other Lord besides me, so worship me. Now imagine the person says, well, what? You want me to worship you? What? Why do I have to worship you? Allah says, Inna sa'ata atiyatun akadu ukfiha litujza kullu nafsim bima tasa'a This is in Surah, surah Taha, Surah 20, Ayah number 14, Ayah number 15. Allah says that the hour, the last hour, I've kept it hidden. You're going to come to the last hour. You're going to come to the final end of this world and then you're going to be brought, brought in front of me on the Day of Judgment. So the person says, you, you speak, is this Qur'an, is this yours? Imagine this is the question, because there's many questions that these youth have in their minds. Is this Qur'an yours? How do I know that this Qur'an is yours? So Allah Azza wa says in Surah Baqarah, Surah number two, okay, right at the beginning, uh, this is in Ayah number 23. <laughs> Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِّمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِ Allah says that if you have any doubt about the thing that we've revealed, then try and bring something which is the equal to this Qur'an, that is really good as this Qur'an. And Allah said, the challenge is, 
try and change this Quran. If you can change this book, this is my challenge to you, then it's not from me. I, as Allah, have said, have said, have said to you that you can't change it. Now, let me, to understand this, let me give you an example. If a person finished a PhD thesis and it was 100,000 words, right? PhD thesis, 100,000 words he finished it. Imagine I finished the thesis and I came in front of the whole of the world on Facebook or on social media and I made an announcement and it was reported in all the news channels. The whole world heard me say this. I said, okay, this is my thesis, 100,000 words. I challenge anyone to find one mistake in my 100,000 words. If you find one mistake, then I will give away my PhD and I will rip this whole thing up. If I say that to the whole of the world, what will the whole of the world do? Tell me. <laughs> what are they going to do? I said any type of mistake, whether it's grammatical mistake, writing mistake, whether it's a punctuation mistake, whether it's a concept mistake, whatever. What will people do? <coughs> find a mistake. They'll find, they'll find a, will they find a mistake or not? Yes. Will they find a mistake or not? Yes. Most definitely they'll find a mistake. Allah Azza wa has kept this challenge on the earth for 1400 and something years and said, find one mistake in the Quran. <coughs> find one or try and change it. Try, try and change this book or find one mistake in the Quran. Allah Azza wa has said in the Holy Quran, this is Surah number 4, ayah number 82. وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا If this Qur'an was from other than Allah, then you would have found many differences within the Qur'an, many, many discrepancies within, within the Qur'an. So the person says, what about if I don't believe in this Qur'an? What about if I say, look, I don't want to believe in this Qur'an? So what? Allah Azza says in the whole Qur'an, Surah number two, number twenty-four. Allah Azza wa said, "Well, if you don't, if you're not going to do that, if if you're not going to take up my challenge, and you can't, you're going to say, okay, I, I don't care about the challenge of your Quran. I don't care even if I can't change your Quran. I don't want to believe in your Quran." Allah says, "Okay." Then you better get prepared for the for the afterlife and the fire that I've created because the fire is going to be your destination. What about if I believe in your Quran? Allah Azza wa Jal says, Allah says that I will give you good news. If you're from those believers who believe in this and do does good actions, then you will have the gardens that are kept in the next world. The person says, well, who are you to me? Like as in, why on an earth do I have to believe in all of this? I mean, what's the relationship that you have with me? And Allah Azza says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Maryam, He says, وَقَدْ خَلَقْتُكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَلَمْ تَكُ شَيْئًا Allah says that I created you when you were nothing at all. I created you when you were nothing at all. This is uh, Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, Ayah number 9. So the person says, well, how do I know that you created me? This is another philosophical question. You understand? It's like, okay, you're saying that you're the, you're the creator. How do I know that you created me? And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in Surah, uh, in, in the 21st, 21st juice of the Holy Quran, uh, this is in Surah Luqman, Surah number 31, Ayah number 11. Allah says, هَذَا قَوْقُ اللَّهِ فَأَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِي بَلِ الظَّالِمُونَ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينَ Allah says that this is the creation of Allah. Show me who has created anything of this kind. Do you guys understand this? You know, if you look at the creation of Allah Azza wa Jalla, there's nothing that will come anywhere near this creation. And then what Allah did is He put a DNA in the creation. So what this means is, if you look at the human, the human, its eyes, the way it's function, the ears, the way it's function, the, let's say, the veins and the, the vessels and the blood. If you look at the animals of the world, they've got the same kind of system within them. 
to the way Allah has created them. And the other thing that Allah has done, subhanAllah, and this is one of his signs on the, on the earth is, and he has mentioned this in two places in the Quran. When we create something, <coughs> we create it exactly the same. If we don't create it exactly the same, there's no beauty. Now, let me give you an example. Look at that fido. <coughs> look at that fido and look at that fido. Are they identical or are they, are they not identical? No. You know this, this, this door that you can push and that door you can see there? Are they identical, yes or no? Yes. yes. If you look at one light and if you look at another light, are they identical, yes or no? The gap between them, are they, are they, is it the same gap between them, yes or no? Yes. The gap in your musalla that's, that's there, is it the same, same length of gap, yes or no? Yes. Only then we have beauty. If you created that door and that door different, if you created this shelf and that shelf different, and a different design, different this, different cut, different size, <coughs> you don't like it. You don't want one big shelf here, one small shelf here, one other shelf here. It, it doesn't make any beauty for us. We want the same size windows you have there, the same aesthetics around, and that's when we find something beautiful. You know what Allah Azawajal does? He creates one big, another one small, another one fat, another one thin, another one, small, another one you know, crooked, another one straight, another one looking like you know, it's very different from this one. He creates all of that in one place and we love it. Let me give you an example. You go to the forest. Tell me, is one tree same from another tree, yes or no? Is there any single tree same from another tree, yes or no? No, you will not find two trees, two branches, two things exactly the same. No, never. But yet, when you look at the different trees, small, big, large, different sizes, different shapes, different types of trees, you look at it all together, subhanAllah, does it look beautiful or not beautiful? Beautiful or not beautiful? You look at the beach, you look at the sand, you look at the texture, you look at the, you look at the, um, the, the earth, you look at the colors of the earth. Everything will be different from one another, but yet it's beautiful for us, and that's Allah Azza wa Jal. The clouds in the sky, none of the clouds are the same, but yet it all looks beautiful to us. Why? Because this is Allah's creation. And Allah said, you want to look at my creation? This is how I create. And if you want to find anything different, then prove to me that anyone else can do the same as this. So the person says, okay, what have you done for me? Allah says, Alam naj'al al-ard nihada, did not create you an earth that is, that is flat? And I created for you certain mountains that will pin the earth to the ground. Did I not? Did, this is in Surah, Surah Naba, Surah number 78, ayah number 6 onwards. And I created you in different pairs. Didn't I give you sleep that cuts you off from the world and gives you rest? Did I not, did not make for you the night? That is like a covering for you. Did not make you the day that is a, a, a means for you to, to earn your livelihood. And did, not, did I not make you seven different layers from above you? And I put a sun there that gives you the strength that you need on the earth. And all the source of life comes from that. And the second source of life is the water that I give you from the skies that comes above you in abundance. And from there I, I take out from you the seed and the vegetation that you need. And I give you the gardens that are in the thick gardens. I give you all of this and you're saying that you, you, you don't know who I am. You don't know what I gave you? So then the person says, well, okay, God. Okay, okay. I've got, I've got a question for you. Why is it that we can't see you? Yes or no? Guys, I, I think some of you, are you losing your iman, some of you? Or? You guys seem to be quite dull today. Are you guys following me, yes or no? Yes. The question is, okay, God, why can't I see you? I see you, I believe you, I don't see you, I don't believe you. So the answer to that Allah says in Surah An'am, Surah number 6, Surah number 6, uh, sorry, uh, Surah number 6, Surah number 6, which is Surah Al-An'am, and this is Ayah number 103. Allah says, <laughs> Allah says that no eyes can capture God. Eyes can't capture God. He's too magnificent. Yet he captures all sights. 
And then Allah Azza wa has given us an example in the Quran. He says, okay, if you think you want to see me, I'll tell you about someone who said to me that he wanted to see me. This is Surah 7, Surah A'raf, Ayah number 143. Allah says, When Moses came, Musa salam, came to meet me, and I was speaking to him directly. Musa said, Lord, Lord, please show me, I want to see you. Allah said, Oh Moses, oh Musa, you will never be able to see me. Never. Not in this world. In the Akhirah, yes, but not in this world. But look at the mountain. Look at this mountain, this particular mountain. Because if you look at the Tur, Tur is a set of many, many mountains together. And one of those mountains, Allah says, Look at this particular mountain. فَإِنِ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي if, if this mountain is able to resist what I show it, then you're going to be able to see me. فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّى رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ When Allah Azza wa Jal showed whatever He showed to the mountain, the whole mountain crumbled to pieces. And Musa alayhi salam fell down. خَرَّ مُوسَى صَعِقَ Musa alayhi salam fell down. Musa after he gained his consciousness, he got up. He got up and he said, Subhana, he said, You Allah, you are super. Subhana actually means super. Like you are glorified to me. You are way beyond anyone that can ever try and describe you, explain you. Took to elect, I ask for your forgiveness. I'm the first to believe in you. I'll never ask to see you again. Because if Allah Azza wa Jalla had revealed that to Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam would have burnt to shreds. He would have burnt to shreds. So Allah Azza wa Jalla showed whatever he showed to the mountain, and the mountain couldn't resist it. And that's the answer for anyone who says that they can't see God because the thing is, it's too powerful. You're going to say to me, well, no, 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 I want to see God. I want to see God. Where is he? Where is he? I want to see God. You can't even look at the sun midday when there's no clouds in the sky with your naked eye. You can't look into the sun. You can't look at the sun. Yes or no? If you look at the sun and you can't even look at the sun and you look at the sun midday, broad daylight, no clouds in the sky, you know, scorching heat, you look at the sun, you look at the sun, you're going to go blind. That's the sun for God's sake. That's the sun in the in the, in the, in the uh, you know in, in, in uh, around our, our earth. Imagine what Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, it is this beyond our, our own recognition of what might actually happen. So the person says, Do I really have to believe in this? Do, do I really have to believe in all of this? Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Holy Quran, it's your choice. You want to believe in this or you don't want to believe in this? It's your choice for now. For now, it's your choice. Then Allah Azza wa says in the Holy Quran, because, you know, people say, do we have freedom? Freedom of thought, freedom of belief, freedom of this, freedom, freedom, freedom. Most of the trouble that we got into, okay, in this earth is because of there's too much freedom. Is too much freedom good for you or bad for you? Is free, too much freedom good for you or bad for you? You leave a whole bunch of chocolates and and snacks and you know sugary stuff in a cupboard in your house and you tell your kids, kids, that cupboard is yours. Yum! Go and eat as much as you want. Papa not gonna say anything. You go and eat as much as you want. And the kids are gonna be really happy. They're gonna eat and eat and eat and eat. After a while they've got stomach ache. After a while they got toothache. After a while they got you know, this ache and that ache. After a while the teeth are black. After a while the teeth have to be taken out. And you say to them, don't worry, just, just carry on. Just, just take the sugar. Daddy loves you. <laughs> now that's not love, my friend. That's not love. We know that's not love. You're killing your children to give them the, that kind of freedom. It's not good for your children. The same thing is Allah Azza wa Jalla has said, yes. You want freedom on this earth? 
You want to do whatever you want? You can have it. What's going to happen to you next is something you've got to think about. Just like the kid takes all those sweets inside and so on, and then there's upset stomach and the upset teeth. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Holy Quran, Surah Kahf, Surah number 18, Ayah number 29, He says, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Say that this truth is from your Lord. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ Whoever wants to believe, let him believe. وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to deny, let him deny. إِنَّا أَعْتَدْنَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ نَارًا but for those people who deny and they become oppressors because they deny this Quran, I've prepared for them a fire in the next life. That, that is the ultimate thing of the next life, that you're going to have to face the thing that Allah has kept in the next life. And the person says, okay, so why do I have to believe that there's only one God? Why can't there be multiple gods? This is another philosophical question that they have. Why can't there be multiple gods? So Allah Azza wa Jal has, has answered that in the Holy Quran and He has said, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِنَّ اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا Allah says in Surah Anbiya, Surah number 21, Ayah number 22. If there was in the whole heavens and the earth, Allah has created, if He create, if there were, like you know the heavens and the earth, okay? If in that there was more than one God, imagine there were many gods, Allah says both the heavens and the earth would have been completely destroyed. You're going to say, why? You tell me, why not? Okay, you put two women in a kitchen. You know what I'm saying? Now? <laughs> if you put the mother-in-law in the kitchen, daughter-in-law in the kitchen, and you tell both of them, both of you, both of you run this kitchen equally. You have equal power in this kitchen. Yeah? You know what equal power in the kitchen means? Equal handy, equal basham. Handy basham. There's going to be a proper bust up. Either you say that the mother-in-law is in charge and she, she says what happens or the daughter-in-law is in charge and she says this is my cooking time. I don't want my mother-in-law here in the kitchen. You guys understand or not? <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say, yeah? You go to a parliament, the same thing. You can't have two people running the parliament. You can't have two, two people equally running one country. It doesn't happen. Imagine now what would happen if there's... Because what does God mean? You know what God means? The definition of God is that there is unlimited everything. That's what the definition of God is. There's no limits to anything. So, if you say, I just want to, I hope I'm not losing you guys. Are you guys following me, yes or no? Yes? Okay, I hope not, I'm not losing you, yeah? If you say, Anur Mia, and Gulab Mia, if you say Anur Mia is the strongest, he's the best, he's the number one, if you say Gulab Mia is the best, he's the strong. I'm sorry if anyone's name is Anur Mia. <laughs> It's the chairman, stop doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just came out of my mouth. I don't know who, I don't know who these people are. Okay. So imagine you said, <coughs> he's the best, he's the toughest, and you say, this one's the toughest, he's also the toughest. One day, both of them are going to come head to head. Okay, one day they're going to come head to head. They both can't be the strongest. One, if you say he's the strongest, and you say he's the strongest, well, no, that doesn't make sense. Strongest and strongest, they can't be equal. One of them will try and see if he's stronger than the other one. Okay? If you say God, God means he's all everything, meaning that there's no limits to anything that he has. So if one God you said he has no limits to anything, and the other God you said there's no limits to anything, well, one of them got to be right, and the other one's going to say, well, I'm stronger than you. And if the other one says, well, no, you're not stronger than me, and you're not that powerful than me, I'm more powerful than you. It's going to be like, okay, prove it. Prove it. You guys understand? And then we're going to say, okay, let's step outside the mosque. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, but I need to get the hell done. You know, man, come on, let's show it. The same one was going to happen is that one God's going to say, well, I'm calling you out. Well, he's gonna, I'm calling you out as well. And there's going to be this kind of, okay, you know, if one God created, imagine this, yeah? One God created the mountains and the other one created the, the, the trees. That God's going to say, okay, you know your trees? I'm going to start plucking them one by one. I'm going to destroy all your trees. Say, okay, I'll destroy all your mountains. 
I'll do this, I'll do that. Imagine there's going to be chaos. So Allah said there's going to be chaos if there was more than one God. No God will ever allow um, someone to call himself God to exist. Because what you're saying is you are as powerful as, as what God should be. Anyway, let's move on. Imagine a person says, well, okay, so give me some proof that you, you, Allah, or God, or whatever you are, you actually exist. Give me some proof other than the Quran. Other than the Quran, give me some proof. Allah has taught, I'm not going to give you the evidence of the Quran, I'm going to give you evidence from people's lives, but I'm going to quote the Quran. Okay, I'm going to quote the Quran. Allah says, you know when the moment comes that everything, every hope that you got has died. You got no hope left. No hope left. Allah says, at that moment, I want to ask you, who do you call? Allah did not say this to the believers. Allah said this to the whole of mankind. Okay, so I'll give you an example. The example is in the 11th Jews. And this is in uh, Surah uh, Yunus. Okay. Surah Yunus, Surah number 10, ayah number 22. Allah says, Who are the you say, Yiruhum fil barri wal bah? It is He who takes you through the lands and the seas. Hatta idha kuntum fil fulk. Until you are in the ship. Wajawaina bihim mirihim. And then I give them really nice wind that sails their you know, ship across the sea. And they're really happy with the wind that blows. Suddenly there's a storm that comes. And now the sea is surging and waves are coming from all different directions. And they're going up and down. And now they think that they're completely lost in the sea. The ship is going to turn over and they're going to die. These are who? These are the mushriks, the, one that, the ones that believed in many different gods in the Prophet's time. And they are the ones, whenever they went out to sea, okay, this is what happened. And you know what they did? You know what they did? Subhanallah. Ikrama, who was the son of Abu Jahl. You guys know Abu Jahl? Yeah. Abu Jahl was the worst enemy of the Prophet. Ikrama was his son. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi took over Makkah. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi made an announcement. I want Ikrama to be brought in front of me. Because Ikrama was a big enemy of Islam, just like his father. So Ikrama ran away. He said, I'm going to run away. He ran, 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 went to the port. He found uh, some sailors. He said, you know what? I'm going to leave the whole of Hijaz. The whole of whatever Saudi is right now. I'm going to leave the whole of Hijaz. So he got onto the ship. He went with the sailors. They went out to sea. And suddenly there was a storm. And in this storm, what happened is that the ship was going to, was about to overturn. All the sailors were, were worried. And Ikrama said, Ya Hubul, Ya Lat, Ya Uzza. He said, O oh Hubul, O oh God of Hubul, O oh God of Lat, O oh God. And the other sailors took him down. They put their hands in front of his mouth. Sh Shut up. Be quiet. Ikrama said, oh, What's going on? He said, You just. <laughs> it comes in what's wrong? I'm calling out God. Says, Shh. It comes in what's wrong? Listen, listen. We say this. You're not a sailor. You don't understand. You can call whoever you want when you go back to the land. Okay? But out here on the sea, there's only one God that comes to your rescue. That is only Allah. <laughs> you can say that. If you call Allah, you get help. You call your lad, your uzza, your hubul, your hubul, nothing gonna happen. You're gonna go down, mate. You're gonna go down. So Ikram and Kaur said, so, Whoa, whoa, I never knew this. I'm gonna minute, I'm gonna minute. Ikram and Kaur, all my life, I fought Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I fought all my life, yeah. And I fought him because he was saying there's only one God, that's Allah. And we were saying there's Lat, there's Uzzah, there's Manat, there's this, there's Hubal, there's this God, that God. And he was saying none of these gods exist except for Allah. He straight away made a dua to Allah. He said, oh Allah, if you save me from this storm, I will go straight back and I will take Iman at the hands of Muhammad And Allah rescued them from sea. 
He turned back, he went all the way back to the land, he went straight to our Prophet Muhammad hand to hand, he embraced Islam. Now this is not just a Ikram. I am telling you today, alright, I'm telling you today, uh, you can ask non-Muslims this. Forget Muslims, forget Christians, forget Jewish people, forget any faith, okay? Non-Muslims who don't believe in God, when they're in a crisis, okay, when they're in a crisis that they know nothing can help them, that's when the only thing that comes out from their mouth is God, 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 please, 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 God, please, please, God, 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 please, So many things I've, I've come across, I'll give you an example. Uh, Columbine High School, there was a shooting in 1999 in America. Right? Some of the students in the dormitory, they had to hide in cupboards because there was this maniac, two maniacs that came around and they were shooting you know, high school students. And I read an entire article about this. They interviewed the students later on, and some of the students said, we don't know what happened to us. We went in those closets, we hid in the closets, and we stand, stood still because these guys came with machine guns, they came with grenades, they came with everything to kill as many students and teachers as they could. And as they walked along the corridor and they came towards our room, <coughs> the students said, right, in the closets, under the table, in other places, they said, I don't know what went in my mind, but at that time, I started to call God. Never believed in God, never believed in God, but at that time, only God came from, from inside. And later on, they say, well, I don't know what happened, but that, that, that's the moment that, you know, I just turned to God. You know what? Allah Azza has said that when that moment comes, then you know what? You'll, you'll only know who I am. I'm going to ask you a question, all of you who are here today. Have you ever been in a situation where you called Allah Azza wa Jal and you desperately needed him and you had no other way to turn to, ex no one to turn to except for Allah Azza wa Jal and that Allah Azza wa Jal helped you? Have you ever been in that situation? Put your hand up. Now I want you to look around. Put your hands, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, please. Please, hands up. This is Iman, this is Iman. I've been in this situation. Put your hands up. Now I can see so many hands. Uh, Sayyid, I hope you're getting this in the camera, right? There are so many hands here. Okay, now these are not people who are lying. I've been in situations in my life where I've seen that there's nothing that can save me except Allah and I've made dua to Allah and at that time I found, wow, this, this, this is happening. This is, the, this is the thing about believers. When you have faith and you turn to Allah then you will find you know, a rescue. Now imagine the person says that, okay, God, okay, so what's my problem? What's my problem if I don't want to believe in you? Allah Azzawajal says in the whole Quran, Ya ayyu al-insan, ma harraka bi rabbika al-kareem. Allah says, O oh, human being, what has deceived you from your most noble and most generous Lord? Allah Azzawajal says, this is in Surah, Surah 82, Surah Al-Infitar, Ayah number 6. Allah Azza said, you know, you know, Subhanallah, my Ustaz, my Lord, Rahim said a wonderful thing. He said, he said that Allah has gifted the human so much, so much, so much, so much, that the human in the gifts has forgotten Allah. Do you guys understand what I'm trying to say? You know that example I gave you of the kid in the house? That's exactly what happens. Nobody knows, even these youngsters, I'm telling you about these youngsters. These youngsters, when they grow up, the first half of their life is like, you know, dad don't know anything, mom don't know anything. What do they know? What do they do for us? What's this? They don't know the sacrifices the parents made for the children. Yes or no? Do they know the sacrifice or they don't know the sacrifice? They don't know. Until those kids grow up, they go beyond 30, they get into real life and they have their own children and then they realize what the parents did for them. Yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Or the person gets to, you know, person gets to a certain age, he sees, wow, you know what, what I've done it myself, oh my God. That's when they say, may Allah give my dad this, may Allah give my mom this, even though the dad and mom have passed away. The same thing happened with the human being. The human being does not know God until the human being loses the gifts that God gave the human being. Either the, you know, one of the, one of the reasons, I, I'm, I'm going to answer a question for you. 
you know, in, a, in a every masjid you have, you see a few old people in the masjid, yes or no? Yes. Regular old people, yes or no? Yes, yes or no, guys? Yes. yes. And those, these men who are old, may Allah bless them, say, I'm, I'm, I'm there in the mosque. And you know, you know one of the reasons why they're in the masjid? I'm not saying that's the only reason why they're in the masjid. But one of the reasons why people get old and then they want to make sure that they're in the masjid is because they've lost many of the gifts that me and you have. Their bodies are giving in. Their health is dropped down. They lost a lot of the things that Allah gave them at youth. Their eyes are not working properly. The hearing is not working properly. They're thinking that, you know what? Gift after gift after gift is gone. Hair was lost a long time back. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, the gift of hair was lost a long time back. The gift of, you know, being able to be agile and run around, be lost, lost. They can just about walk now. And you know, when you lose your gift, you understand what gift was. You only appreciate your gift before you have it or after you lose it. And that's what happens with these people. They, they've now lost it. They know what the gift is. Okay? Most of us that are young, we don't have the same, same you know, luxury. We, we, we don't have the same thought as his own men. And the next time that everybody knows who Allah is, is when we've gone to the Akhirah and we have no more dunya. That's when, Allah, that's when everybody will know who Allah is. So, the next question that this person has is, okay, okay, God, okay, okay. I understand what you're trying to say, God. Because this is one of the things that a lot of our Asian and Arab upbringing has done. There's been a massive damage in the Asian and Arab upbringing. In the Asian and Arab upbringing, you know what we said? Most of you have heard this. Hey, so this are namaz gaya for us, for us. Namaz for Go and go, you know, pray. Namaz na for le Yes or no, guys? Yes. Guys, I'm going to ask you again. Have you heard this phrase, yes or no? Yes. Some of you are Muslim. Yes. Have you heard the phrase yes or no? Yes. If you don't pray, you go to hellfire. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. It's true. It's true. If you don't pray, you will go to hellfire. But Allah Azza wa Jal didn't introduce prayer in the Quran like that. Allah didn't say that. Okay, fine. If you don't listen to me, then I wanna punish you. La hawla wa la. You 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 think you know what happens to kids? When they grow up and they hear this again and again, it means that I've got to pray just to get away from hellfire. Why didn't you say to your children, if you pray, Allah will love you. If you pray, Allah will give you jannah. Why not say, namaz for le besh Why say, namaz na for le duzuho If you don't pray, then you're going to go to hellfire. That's negative. You've made God look negative, na'udhu billah. It's true that if you don't pray, you'll go to hellfire. But why use it like that? Why not say, if you pray, you'll get Jannah, you'll get Paradise. If you pray, you'll get Allah's help. If you pray, because Allah said that in the whole Quran, He said, Ya ayyuladina anu sa'idu bisab yu salat. Or you believe, if you want help from me, then pray. I'll give you help. Allah said that in the whole Quran. And we are saying, if you don't pray, eh, duzuhu zulbe, morbe, you're gonna be burnt black, the, 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 you know, the snakes are gonna go all over you, they're gonna swallow you, they're gonna bite you, they're gonna, the scorpions are gonna pinch you. Why, 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 why go down that? And you know Allah said in the whole Quran? Yes, SubhanAllah, most people don't talk about this. This is in Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah number 147. Allah says, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ Allah says, this is Allah's words. Allah says, what will Allah want to do by punishing you? What will, why would Allah want to punish you? إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ If you show gratitude, if you are thankful, and if you believe, then why, I, as Allah, would I want to punish you? وَكَانُ اللَّهُ شَاكِنًا عَلِيمًا I, as Allah, am very appreciative of what you, very appreciative of what you do. Alima, I know, well know, what you know everything about you. I don't want to punish you. This is my Quran. Okay? So the next question is, so, so that means you're a good God, right? You're a good God, okay? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the whole Quran, and this is this is a beautiful ayah in the whole Quran. This is in the twenty-first, uh, sorry, the twenty-third juz of the Quran. So I'm just going to bring the ayah out for you. This is the twenty-third juz, Surah Zumar, Surah number thirty-nine, ayah number seven. Allah says, 
If you are ungrateful, then I as Allah, I don't need you. But I don't want, I'm not pleased if you are ungrateful and if you deny this. But if you are thankful and if you show thanks to me, because our salah, our namaz, our prayer is actually thanks to Allah. That's what it is. When you give zakah, it's thank you Allah for giving me all this money. I'm going to give some of it back to the poor people. When you, when you uh, do anything that is to do with Islam, what you're trying to show Allah is I'm thanking you. Thank you Allah for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to do something back to show how much I appreciate whatever you've done for me. Allah says, If you are thankful, I'm going to be pleased with you. Like the person says, okay, what about, if, why do you need me, why do you need me to worship you when you've got so many that are worshiping you? That's another question that they have. Why is it that you need me? Allah says, وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ <laughs> On the day of judgment, everyone's going to come on his own. You're not going to take the burden of anybody else. Allah says, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى Nobody's going to take the sin of anyone else on them, and nobody on the day of judgment is going to bail anyone else out. You've got your own life and your own duties to do. And if the person says, okay, when I'm dead, you're going to bring me back to life again? What's the proof of that? What's the proof? Because one of the philosophical questions is this. This is a, this is a big question. I remember one atheist, uh, I went to a, a secondary school once to, to, as, as a panel to give, to give a talk. And the atheist uh, that was a representative, that, you know what he said? He said to all the students, there, was about, there were about 200 students here. He said, have you seen anyone come back to life again after death? Wow. Imagine this question he said to you, yeah? Have you ever seen anyone die and then come back alive again? Yes or no? No, you haven't. So he said, well, if you haven't seen them come back alive, then they're not going to come back alive. He said, if you kill a fly, do you see the fly come back alive again? No, you don't. So no fly come back alive, no human come back alive. When he's dead, he's dead. He's gone. It's finished. I thought, subhanallah, <laughs> he basically dropped an atom bomb and just went. So then I had to come back and I had to answer the same question. And I said, okay. I said, every year Allah shows us life after death. And this is in the Quran. Every year Allah shows the whole life and death right in front of us. And we just think nothing of it. And the answer is right in front of us. Allah says in the whole of Quran, this is in the 17th uh, Juz, Surah Hajj, Surah Hajj, Surah number 22, ayah number 5. Allah says, Wataral Allah says, You see a dead piece of land. When I put water back again, you see life again. Now, we all know about the Sahara Desert that is dead, and then Allah brings it back life again. But I'm going to give you one around here. Every tree around us dies in winter, and it comes come back to life again in spring, and it's fully flourishing in summer, and it then dies again, slowly goes old again in autumn, and dies again in winter. And Allah says, okay, if you don't want to, if you don't want to take that as an example, there is another example that Allah, Allah has given to us in the whole of Quran. And this is a stronger one. Allah says, you die every day, and you wake up again every day. This is in the Quran, Surah Zumar, Surah, Surah, Surah 39, Ayah number 42. Allah says, Allah yatawaffal anfusa hina mawtiha. Allah gives the reward to the souls when they're dead. Wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. And the ones who have fully died, they haven't fully died, but they're like dead when they're sleeping. You know when we go to sleep, we say, Allah for bismi ka mawti yes or no? Yes. You know what that means? It means, oh Allah, I am about to die in your name and then I'm going to come back alive in your name. When we wake up in the morning, we say, Alhamdulillah, you know what that means? 
I owe praises to Allah who brought me, who brought me back to life again after I died. And one day I'm gonna make my final return to, to Allah. Do you understand? You know when a person is sleeping, they're gone. They don't know what's around them. They're at the complete mercy of those people who are around them. And Allah Azza wa he, he looks after them while they're sleeping and they don't, they don't, you know, understand. So the person says this, he says, okay. Okay, God, I've got another question for you. And this is a big question of today's time. A lot of atheists ask this question. They say, why do you, why do you have to have something like hellfire, which is a maximum, maximum, maximum punishment? Why? Why not have something like a small punishment? Do you guys understand? Or you don't understand? It's like, you know in this, in this earth, you're going to have like, you know, maximum punishment is going to be some kind of torture. But if you listen to the description of hellfire, it's like, whoa, it's beyond our reason. And you know why? I'll, I'll tell you one reason why Allah has made hellfire what hellfire is. is because some people, this kind of torture on the earth is nothing. If you said to if Allah said on the, in the Quran, if he said, you know what, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to hit you with a rod. I'm going to like, I'm going to just uh, maybe, maybe, maybe hit you a few times and get my angels to hit you a few times. I'm going to beat you, give you waterboarding and I'm going to, you know, you know what some people on the earth will say? That's nothing, man. There's a lot of people on the earth who say, that's nothing, man. I can take that. That's one, but I'm not going to give you the answer. The answer is, when you disobey an authority, depending on what your disobedience is and depending on what kind of authority you disobey, you get a different type of punishment. So let me give you, give you an example. When you disobey the school rules, it's going to be the school punishment. Yes or no? Yes? When you disobey something higher than that, let's say university, you did something in university you shouldn't do, it's going to be higher. When you disobey the rules of a workplace, you're going to be fired and probably fined. When you disobey the rules of the government and the law, you're going to be fined accordingly. So if your disobedience was because you smoked at a place you shouldn't smoke, it'll be a small fine. But if your disobedience was that you actually killed someone, it's going to be a full sentence. And if you did something of treason, or if you did something which was which is uh, really, really, it's, it's going against the, the very essence of why you're there, then there's going to be high punishment. When you, imagine this, and I want you to understand this. When you have denied or done something against the one who has given you everything you have, then it's on a total different level. And Allah has said in the whole Quran, Jaza Wifaqa is gonna be according to whatever Allah Azza wa Jalla has, has placed. Now it's not just punishment, because there's a lot of delights and gifts that Allah has kept in the in the next life. Now imagine a person says, Okay, what about okay, what about it's not my fault, okay? It's my parents' fault. If I end up with, if I go back to you and I say that it wasn't me, it was my parents and they messed up and because they messed up, I messed up, okay, and, and that's my excuse on the Day of Judgment, Allah Azza wa says, no, you can't bring that excuse to me on the Day of Judgment because you have your own abilities to think. So he says in Surah A'raf, Surah number 7, Ayah number 173, Allah says, if you, if you come to me and say your parents were the ones who committed shirk before and therefore you committed the shirk and assigned fathers with Allah, then you are the ones who are guilty on your own account, not because of any other account. Then the people say, okay, okay, okay. So I have to become, I have to come to these religious people. What about these religious people who are corrupt and who, who don't, you know, some religious people, they don't even practice what they preach. That's another big argument against religion because there's certain religion, religious people who don't practice what they preach. And Allah Azawajal has said, "Kabula maqtan inda Allahi an taqulu ma la tafarun." This is in uh, Surah uh, Surah number. So this is, this is in the twenty twenty eighth juz of the Holy Quran. Okay. Surah number sixty one, ayah number three. Allah says, "It's it's very, it's a it's a big thing, and it makes Allah very angry that a person says something that that they preach." And they don't practice it. So Allah says, their account is with me. Okay? The person says, okay, 
What about the fact that these people become extremists? Allah said in the Holy Quran, لا تغلو في دينكم. He said, don't, don't bring any, don't make a religion extreme. You know, don't, don't bring extremism to a religion. Okay, you want to see this? Uh, Surah number five, ayah number seventy-seven. The person says, "Okay, what about the fact that you, Allah, you're a good God? Okay, you're a good God. Then why did you create problems on the earth? This is another big question. Why is it that you, as Allah, have given us many problems on the earth? And Allah Azza wa Jalla says." Allah says the whole of your life and the whole of your death is so that I can test and I can I can show you which I want to see which one of you comes with the best of actions. This is in Surah number 67, Surah Mulk, at the beginning you will find this. And Allah said many verses like this. He's going to test us with 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 fear. He's going to test us with hunger. He's going to test us with things that he will make deficient in our lives. This is in Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, ayah number 154, uh, 155, if you look at it there. SubhanAllah, so, so you say, okay, so you created these problems. Why God, if you want, why couldn't you, oh God, stop the fighting and the killing on the earth? Why can't you just stop that? Why is there so much fighting and so much killing on the earth? Why have you allowed that? Allah says in the Holy Quran, Surah number 2, ayah number... Two five three. He says, "Walau sha Allahu maqtatalu, walakin Allah yafalu ma yurid." Allah says, "If I if I want to stop them fighting, I would have done it. I can do it, but I do what I want." And then Allah has said in the Holy Quran, Surah two, Surah number Surah number two, Ayah number two five one. He says, "A certain people, He makes them take out other people on the earth through wars, because if certain people are not taken out on the earth." then there will be more corruption on the earth. And yes, if Allah wanted to just take them out, He could take them out. But Allah Azza wa says in the Holy Quran, you know, one, of the, one of the questions to Allah is, well, if you wanted to guide them, you could have just guided them. Allah says, well, sha Allah If I, as Allah, wanted to guide all of you, I could have guided you. But the point of you coming on this earth is, I have created you so that you can be tested and you can be given a body that is attached to this dunya, a ruh and a soul that is attached to the akhirah, like the malaika and the angels, and I want to see which one of those that you give preference to. The person says, okay, so why don't you just, just, do you, why don't you just protect? Allah says, I protect you most of the time. It's only a few times that I decide for some reason that I don't want to protect you. In Surah number, uh, Surah Tariq, in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jalla has said, "In kullu nafsi lamma alayha hafil." Every human being has got an angel that protects it. A lot of harm that was supposed to come to us, Allah Azza wa Jalla does not allow that harm to come to us. Surah number, surah number eighty-six, Surah Tariq, you'll find that ayah. Now, the person says, "Okay, so why don't you, when I make du'a to you?" Okay, because you know dua we make to Allah, not every dua is answered, yes or no? Is every dua answered? No. And that's another argument against us. Why, why is it that you can't pray for anything from God and just get it? Allah Azza wa says in the Holy Quran, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا عِنْدَنَا خَزَائِنُهُ Allah says in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Hijr, Surah number 15, Ayah number 21. He says, there is nothing, but I have plenty, plenty of that thing, abundance of it. But I will not give it except in due proportion, in the portions. Due portions I will give it. But he says, whoa, 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 hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Why don't you just make everyone <coughs> rich and everyone have all the blessings they want and therefore everyone could be happy? Right? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? You as God, you can just make everyone dark and true, everyone becomes happy, everyone has what they want, and we will live happily ever after and we can just worship you. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Allah says in the Holy Quran,
Allah says, if I was to open up my treasures and my gifts to everyone, and I gave everyone my gifts to them, everyone, now you want this? Okay, have it. You want this? Have it. You want that? Have it. Allah says, if I did that, this is, this is Surah number 42, and number 27. Allah says, if I did that, there will be a lot of corruption on the earth. Because people, when they get a lot, you know the people that are the naughtiest on the earth are the ones that have a lot on the earth. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, the most people, the people who are corrupt in the earth the most are the people who have got a lot of the gifts of Allah that Allah has given them. So the person says, okay, why have you, okay, this is another question, okay, that people have, subhanAllah, this is, a, this is one of those questions you might be thinking about. I'm going to finish in the next few minutes. Next few minutes I'll be finished and I'm going to open up to a Q&A. Why is it that we see most of the people who don't believe in you, they're wealthy, they're healthy, they're fine, they're having good lives, they don't believe in you. Is that true or not? Guys, come on, is that true or not? We see some of the believers, some of the believers, they're suffering, yes? Some of the non-believers are also suffering. But we see a large number of the non-believers who don't believe in Allah, who are against the religion, who are doing things that they're not supposed to do, and yet Allah says, okay, you want this, I'll give you this, I'll give you that, I'll give you a gift, I'll give you that, I'll give you that. Why? So Allah says, Innama. Allah says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَأَوْلَادُهُمْ Allah says, let not their wealth and let not their children amaze you and let them not think that, that they've got it all. Okay, this is the Quran, Surah uh, Tawbah, Surah number 9, ayah number 55. Allah says, Allah says, through this, I'm going to punish them. Because they will get what they want, and in the end, they will not have what they want. And Allah says, You should not look at what people have now, you should look at what people will have in the end. For then, the end is not very good. For you as believers, your end is going to be very good. The person says, okay, so now, you as God, what do you want me to do? Allah says, O people, you should worship the Lord. This is Surah number 2, Ayah number 21. Worship the Lord. The person says, well, why worship? Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I never created you in the first place except that you will bow down to me and you will recognize that I am your Lord. That's the only reason I created you in the first place. I never asked you for anything. I never asked you for, for you to feed me. I feed you, I give you, and all I want you to do is to appreciate and to acknowledge that I'm your master and you're my servant, or you're my slave, and that's it. Okay, this is uh, Surah number 27. Sorry, uh, so Jews number 27. Surah 51, Surah Dhariyat, and Ayah number 56. <coughs> Ayah number 56. Allah, I'm 57, Allah says, Ma uridu minhu mirris. I never asked any of the creation to provide me anything. Wa ma uridu an yud'imun. I don't want them to feed me. Inna Allah huwa al-razzaq dhul quwwat al-mateen. I as Allah, I feed everyone, but I want just some appreciation and some of that from you. Now, I do understand that many of you will have more questions, okay? So I'm going to open the floor right now. I'm going to open the floor right now, and I really want you to ask your questions. Even if it's not questions from you, you could say, well, I heard this question. I heard this question, and I want to ask you this question, right? Uh, it could be from a friend you've heard, it could be from school that you've heard, so that we can have these questions being asked, and then we can have a reply for it. And let me just tell you another question that comes up. It's like, can God create, this is a question that they say, it's a very silly question. Can God create something that is bigger than Him and heavier, so heavy that He can't lift it up? This is another question that they ask. Have you ever heard that question? Can He create something that's bigger than Him 
and had more heavy than what he could that he could lift. It's a very silly question. Why? Because God is unlimited. If God creates something that is bigger than him and heavier than what he can lift, then is he unlimited or is he limited? Limited. Would he be God anymore? No, he wouldn't be anymore. God anymore. Right? It's like saying, can you, it's like that question, can a triangle be made into a square? Well, a triangle can't be made into a square. Dun, dun. Because a triangle means it has three sides and it has three corners. A square means it has four sides and four corners. If you make a triangle into a square, then what you've done is you either, it's not a triangle anymore, or like you can't call this a triangle, it's a square, right? It was a triangle, but now it's a square because now you're giving it four corners and you're giving it four sides. So no, no, no. We want it to be triangle, but we want it also to be a square. It's like, what are we talking about? You can't have God, which means he's unlimited in everything, and then you say he's limited. That doesn't work. It, it just doesn't make sense. Okay, anyway. Questions, please, right now. Put your hands up. Oh, yes. Um, why did Allah make uh, humans? Well, I just said, why Allah made human beings is that we, we bow down to him, we worship him, we appreciate what is given to us, and that's the whole reason why we're here. And we worship, and we basically we follow what I read in the Quran, and we follow what Allah has revealed to us. Yeah. Yes. A question from a sister that was yeah. there. Uh, what do you say to a child who says, how do you know Islam is a true religion? Uh, I think that's a good one. Okay, I'll just repeat the question to you. So, so the question is, um, Question again, what, what do you say to a child who says, how do you know Islam is a true religion? Or what do you say to a child that says, how do you know Islam is a true religion? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, the thing is that we don't have one answer for this. We don't have one thing that can tell us that Islam is a true religion. We have many. So we have a combination of different things. I've said to you in this uh, whole, whole session a few things. But on top of that, what I would say to you is that the Prophet Sallallahu life, if anyone studies it, if anyone sees that life, if anyone knows who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, if anyone studies what his enemies said about him, what he said, what his words were, and you look at the impeccable life that he had, you will understand that that is also another thing that gives us a, a, a kind of strength to our belief that Islam is true. We believe in the Prophet we believe in his, when we look at his life, it's a miracle. His life is actually a miracle. There are, there are many miracles that Allah has given to us. One of the miracles is that this book is still surviving till today, unchanged. Okay, that's one of the biggest miracles that we have. Uh, the Bible, the Injil, the Torah, all the other revelations have been changed. In fact, there's no book that can ever live time and not be changed in some way or another. This is the only book on the earth for over 1400 years. Cannot ever, it's impossible to change this book. Impossible. I mean, when I say impossible, it's like it can never happen. And the challenge to Allah to the whole of the world is to try and change this. And it's never happened. That's another one. The dua things I said is one thing. The fact that Islam, and this is one thing, I don't know if the child will understand this, but if they're in secondary school, they'll understand this. Islam is the only religion that has got from the Quran and from the teaching of the Prophet which is the Sunnah, the only religion that has got all of the things we need, all of the laws and everything we need directly from Allah's words and the Messenger's words, not from any human being's words, and all aspects of life. So our social lives, individual lives, domestic lives, spiritual lives, financial lives, our political life, our global life, uh, all of these things have got direct quotations from the books. No other religion has this. Yeah. yeah, so let me take some of this. Anyone from secondary school that wants to ask a question? Yeah, go on. Um, just a, a question that my teacher asked. Yeah. If Allah created heaven and hell, why is the roller stick on? If Allah created heaven and hell, why is the roller 
What the role of shaitan? Thing is, Allah Azza wa has created Jannah. He has created Jahannam. He's created paradise and, and hell. Uh, shaitan, according to us, is shaitan is of two kinds. You've got the devil, which is in the devil as a jinn devil, and you've got the devil as a human devil. Devil literally is anyone who disobeys God and who doesn't want to, who doesn't want to listen to God. So you've got many human beings that are devils as well, as well as jinns. You know when we say shaitan, we always think of the invisible one, yes? In fact, but why do you do that? Because the Quran says, Min al jinnati wa nas. If you look at the last surah of the Holy Quran, Allah says, okay, the shaitan, and he says, Min al jinnati wa nas. That exists from the invisible ones, from the jinns, and that exists from the human beings as well. <coughs> so shaitan is one who disobeys God, who is hopeless of the mercy of God, who disobeys God. And they, you know, they, they, they have been deluded, they've been, they've been, you know, they've taken themselves off the path. Um, and they just, you know, one of the big reasons why they don't want to believe is because they're going to have to make, they're going to have to give up something. A lot of people who don't want to accept Islam is because they're going to have to give up something. Either they have to give up the status, they have to give up their, some of the monies, they have to give up some of the lifestyle, they have to give up some of the ways they want to have full freedom, and that hurts them. Many of the Prophet Sallallahu enemies, that's the reason why they never believed. Because they would lose their status, they would lose their, 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 their authority. Okay? And that's why they didn't want to, want to believe. And they would have to then treat the poor with dignity. A lot of people who are rich don't want to do that. They would have to get rid of racism. They have to get rid of jealousy. They have to get rid of pride. They have to get rid of arrogance. Man, who wants to do that? If you got money, if you got power, or if you got, you know, if you lived your life independently, suddenly someone says to you, you have to give up your independence. You have to give up your arrogance. You have to become humble. You have to say sorry. You have to treat people nicely. You have to be treat them equally. You have to give them from your own pocket. You have to look after them. It's like, whoa, why are you gonna do that for? I can do what I want. Well, that's the whole point of Islam, and that's why people don't want to believe in Islam. And that's what the shaitan wants them to do. Wants them to say they have freedom and not to accept any of this. But Another question, two sisters. More, um, three more questions from upstairs. <coughs> in this country, in a mainstream school, right, not Muslim teachers teaching RE or philosophy. So how would you go about this as they are being taught from a non-Muslim perspective? I mean, you covered it in your lecture. But... Well, well uh, the question is about you know, the, the teachers in these schools and what do we do? I will tell you one thing that you can do as parents. You need to have a very good maktab or madrasa system. Your kids need, you know, if your kids are going to these normal schools, your kids better have a good madrasa or a good maktab system like coming to the masjid and actually learning from good teachers because that's going to solidify their thing. That's number one. Second is you as parents at home better teach your, your children Islam. I'm, I'm going to share one thing with you. I, at school, I was at school when I was like six or seven years old. One day I came home and I said to my mom, I said, mom, I said, I'm, I'm only six or seven. Okay, I came from primary school, I came home. And I said, mom, there's something that's bothering me. She said, what? I said, me and my, free, my, 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 my uh, friend, who's a Hindu, we, we were talking about God today. And he said to me, he said to me that all his gods together, they can beat my one god up. Because we got one god, right? And as a kid, I was like, whoa! He's got so many gods, and therefore my one and only god is going to get beat up. How can my religion, you understand, it's such a simple thing, but I came home. And the good thing was, you know, a lot of these doubts and questions that came to me, I used to ask my mother. And my mother used to give me answers to And my mother used to talk to me often about religion. If you, if you as a good parent, open, if you allow your child to open up to you with the questions, and you either give them the answers, or you find a knowledgeable person who gives them the answers, your local imam or whoever it is, Alhamdulillah, that's the best way done. And then my mother sat me down and said, she laughed, she actually laughed at me. She said, you made that in Ilana. She just laughed and said, my son, it's not like that. She said, there's only one God. There are not many, many gods. They, they have the belief that there are many, many gods, but none of those gods can move. They can't talk, they can't speak. Okay? What's the point of those, that many gods who are statues coming in front of what the one God that is a real God? What are those statues? They can't talk, they can't speak. 
unless you would say something like Ibrahim alayhi salam story. Alright? Ibrahim alayhi salam story, and it's a very simple story that when he goes and he smashes all the idols. And it's like a simple, it's like when you hear that story, you think, wow, that's so true. If they can't speak, if they can't eat, if they can't walk, if they can't talk, then they're not really gods. And that's a simple doubt. Right? Two more questions. Yeah. We learn a lot about Darwin's theory of evolution, which states we come from monkeys and apes. How do you educate us which is non Muslims to say we do? Yeah, the question is about Darwin, Darwinism, and that we come from apes and monkeys. You know, Darwin never actually said that. Darwin never said that. Darwin never said that we actually all come from monkeys and apes. He was just making some studies, some analysis, and he said that this. He said that he saw some form of evolution. In fact, evolution has got many different types, and we as Muslims. We even believe in certain evolutions, like we believe in the evolution of a caterpillar to a butterfly. You see this, it's an evolution. Caterpillar to a butterfly, it's an evolution. A tadpole to a frog is an evolution. Now those kind of evolutions, we all believe, we as Muslims, we believe that, okay? But what happened is after Darwin, there were people who actually, you know, they, they, they said that humans don't come from God, they come from, you know, they came from monkeys and, and, and apes. Now that thing is very simple. It's a very simple argument. We want to see, you know, if for, for hundreds and thousands and millions of years, monkeys and apes, their evolution was that they became, you know, first it was like, hoo, 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 hoo. and after that it was like, hoo, 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 hoo. then it was like, hoo, hoo, hoo. it was like, who, who, who. If that was the thing, I want one monkey, one a bring it from Africa, from Brazil, from anywhere, from Bangladesh, whatever you want, India. Just show me one that goes hoo 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 hoo. Yeah, who are you? Yeah. Just I just want one. You show me one, and my whole belief is gonna be smashed. Okay? It's a very simple thing is that you know all their arguments really falls onto nothing. If you look into it, it's such a false argument. None of them have ever proved it. There's no proof for it. All the scientific data they gave about the skulls that looked like it. I mean, who actually says that these skulls were skulls of, you know, the actual transition? Who said that? I mean, this could be a skull of any, anything, any animal. It could be an extinct one. The possibility is there. When a possibility is there, how can you prove that this was a transition from an egg to a actual human being? I mean, it doesn't really stand on, on, on yeah. Last question, sister. Slightly off topic. Um, not off topic, I don't want to be relevant. Um, how to help a spouse who does not pray in order to pray? Allahu Akbar, like the Mahesh Lord. Uh, like, no, 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 off the topic, I want on the topic. I, 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 I completely like the question, right? And she wants something to beat her husband up with, but you know, I'm not going to give that today, okay? Some other day, inshallah. Yes, brother. Well, um, I had a conversation with Ali about having doubts about religion, so he asked me that he knows the story we gave last time. The, old, the lady who drank the water and she was much done of it because, and we all know that she vanished immediately. So he goes basically, it shows that God can do whatever he likes and his stories are arbitrary. Like, you can do whatever he likes at the end of the day, you can do whatever. But then, whenever he likes it, he'll give someone done and he can give it. And he goes, and What's the point? Okay, so this question is that you know, with the famous story of a, of a woman who's a bad woman and then she quenched the thirst of a dog and then she goes to Jannah, the question is, Well, if God can do whatever he wants. And he can basically just change the rules for whoever he wants and put in Jannah who he wants and put in Jannah who he wants. Then what's the point of doing this? Yeah? Well, actually, the person has misunderstood the whole point. The point is that because God can do anything he wants, it's actually the best thing ever. Because it means that if I messed up the worst I've done in my life, I've still got, got hope in the mercy of God. And it makes me have that hope. I can wish for, 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 for a good afterlife. Imagine if God's rules were, were absolutely concrete, spot on. It's like, <laughs> if you mess up, I'm going to make sure that you get punished. If that was the case, then it's like, well, there's nothing. Like the person would be right. What's the point? You might as well just carry on. Right? You might as well just, you're, you're doomed basically. Right? So now that God says that if you mess up, I will forgive you or I can forgive you. It's the best thing ever. Even if you made the worst crime, I can still forgive you. It gives me hope. Now let's switch it the other way. A person who's been very nice and very good and righteous, he can end up or she can end up in hellfire. What does that do? That makes the person humble. 
It's a, again another good thing. Because it makes me not be arrogant and think, you know what? I pray to Allah. You guys don't pray. Ha 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 ha. I'm better than you guys. You guys, you know, will not get my portion of Jannah. Imagine, imagine that. that that's, that's not a good way for, for religious people to act. And that's why God has those rules. But the best thing about it is that Allah said in the Holy Quran in several verses, Inna Allah la yadlimu mithqala dharra Allah does not oppress anyone by the least. By the least he doesn't oppress anyone. Now this is a very, you know, one of the questions about God is, um, if Allah knows, now this is a question, okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and answer in the simplest way I can. If Allah knows that someone is going to go to hellfire and he's on his way to hellfire, and if Allah knows that that's going to happen, and then they end up on the day of judgment, and Allah never stopped them from doing wrong, and Allah never gave them guidance, and they go to hellfire, then doesn't that make Allah an oppressor or a cruel being? Now, Billah, right? Okay, because He could have stopped them. Now, the the answer to that is very simple. You have to work backwards. You have to work backwards. So Allah has said. He does not commit any oppression, not by the, not even an atom's weight. Allah said that. Not even an atom's weight. This is in the Quran, several places. Not even an atom's weight. Now imagine this. When the person gets to the next life, if it is true that the person did wrong and that Allah never stopped them and they had no way of stopping themselves and they ended up in hellfire and Allah allowed all of that to happen, then our logic says that's not good, that's like oppression, right? But you know what? We have to work backwards, which means that there's going to be something on the Day of Judgment that Allah Azza wa Jal will, will have said that will be very, very clear that nobody on the Day of Judgment is going to be oppressed. No person who goes to hellfire will say, Oh Allah, this wasn't my fault, this is your fault and you made me come in here. No. In fact, all the people, there are about six or seven places in the Holy Quran, Allah talks about the people who are sentenced to hellfire and they give a they give a, 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 a uh, answer to Allah. All of them admit that they did wrong. All of them admit, more or less, that they deserved what they got. There's about ten places in the Quran like that. All of them admit that, that if they got one chance again, they'll do something different. You know what that means? That means they were sentenced correctly. Now the missing picture is this. What we don't understand is this. And I want to make this quite clear to you. Not every person who dies as a non-Muslim and not every person who sins is going to end up in hellfire. Do you guys understand? There are, there are non-Muslims who Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to forgive. And this is in our books of Aqidah as well. Not all non-Muslims, but some, and we don't know who. But our Aqidah <coughs> would say that if Islam never came to them, okay? Islam never came to them, then there's no questioning. Our books of Aqidah also say this. And the Quran, I want to I open this to, 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 to you and I want you to understand this. You know this concept that we've got that every one of these individuals is going to go to hellfire. This is not correct to say. Whoever from them Allah sends to hellfire, he will send. Whoever from them Allah forgives, he will forgive. And that's totally up to him. We've got no say in that. Okay, so let me give you an ayah and this will explain this a uh, little, little bit more. This is in Surah Al-Nisa, Surah number 4, and this is Ayah number 165, okay? A very important Ayah. Rusulan Mubashirina wa Mudhirin. Messengers that were sent as messengers giving good news and warning people from the bad that is lying ahead of them. لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَيْهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ حُجَّةٌ بَعْدَ الرُّسُلُ so that there is no argument left, no evidence, nothing that these people have got as a solid argument after the messengers have come. So they've got no argument they can use against Allah because the, 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 the way that the messengers have given them the message 
was clear as broad daylight. It was explained to them without any doubt whatsoever. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا And then Allah Azza wa says that he is, the, he is the most mighty and the one that has, has all wisdom. Now, this ayah is important because the people that have even Islam came to them, was it explained to them in a way that that was satisfying? That's the question, right? Because our books of Aqidah say the people who saw the miracles of the prophets, the people who saw the prophets, the people who had their things explained to them, like Abu Jahal and others, they had no excuse left not to believe. Fir'aun had no excuse not to believe. There are many non-Muslims like that on the earth who have no excuse for not believing Islam. And those are the ones whom Allah Azza wa Jal will give them the kind of treatment that he said. Now there are many others, subhanAllah, that we don't know what their fate is going to be. I'm not going to say to you that everybody else, you know, Allah will forgive. No, I'm not saying that. I want to make this very clear and I hope this is clear in the recording as well because I don't want a whole torrent of people on YouTube and, you know, putting this out there. Oh my God, he said this. Oh my God, astaghfirullah. Oh, no, no. I'm saying all the people of the world, okay, including Muslims and non-Muslims, it is up to Allah who he wants to let off and who he's going to punish. Allah said in the Holy Quran in several places, you عَذِّبُ مَنْ Allah punishes whoever he wants, Allah will have mercy on whoever he wants. Yes, the Lord of Allah is whoever denied the message, then Allah will send them to hellfire. That's in the Quran, yes. But when Allah says kafaru, if you look at the word kafaru, it means kafaru means katamu, it means you hid it. The word kufur, kufur means to hide. What this now means, if you look into the Quranic uh, tafsir, it means there was some belief in there or some reason, good reason for them to believe, but they hid it. They thought, no, I'm not going to believe. That's denial. It's like, I've got reason to believe in this Quran or believe in Islam, believe in Allah, believe in the Messenger. I don't want to do it. For what I think, that's, that's hiding, that's kufr. Now, the people out there that never did kafir, so, so they might have said, for example, they might have said that, I don't believe in Islam. But the same people, Islam was never explained to them properly, or they had no inclination to this belief at all. Their fate is up to Allah what He does to them. I'm not going to say what is going to do them, but that's up to Allah. Okay? I'm not saying they're going to be let off. I'm not saying they're going to be doomed. No. It's up to Allah what He does to them. Okay? But for certain, we can say those people who had clearly had the Iman. There and then they decided to, to cover it and say we don't want to believe in it. Then the, the Quranic fate is very clear that there's going to be a fire awaiting for them and punishment awaiting for them in the next life. Rest of them, we can't say anything, we leave it to God. And that should be our way of, 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 of approaching all of this. Hope that was clear. Okay. Shaykh, we just take one final question from this young brother. Uh, um, young man, what are you going to say? We'll, we'll, we'll keep that question for later, okay? Is there any, is there any, uh... yes, yes. In your case, I'm kind of asking, who created that God? Ah, okay. This, this, is a good, this is a good thing you said uh, in terms of a question, okay? Which is, which is blasphemy, but it's a, it's a good question to put forward. And Rasulullah also even talked about this. He said, Shaitan will, will, will make people doubt and doubt and doubt until he <coughs> get to the stage when he'll make them say, well, who created Allah? Okay. Man, faman, faman khalaq Allah. Who then created Allah? And the thing is about this is, subhanAllah, if you think about the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is, when you say God, God means unlimited. If God had a beginning, would he be unlimited or limited? Limited. Then he can't be God. Sin. We say, no, 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 but our minds don't accept it. No, 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 no. You've got to have a beginning somewhere, right? Because my mother gave birth to me, her mother gave birth to her, her mother gave birth to her, and it carries on, carries on, carries on, carries on. We always see this, like, there was always a beginning to this place, beginning to the masjid, beginning to us as people, beginning to a race, beginning to God. Now, that's human beings. That's the creation. We're limited. The definition of God is He is unlimited in everything. There's no limit to Him whatsoever. If you say that He had a beginning, that's a limit. 
That's a limit to start off from. That means he came out of nothing. No, no, that's not true. He has no limits. He has no beginning, he has no end. Now, we can't, we can't understand this, but there are ways now in the current time to be able to have some kind of understanding of this. If you go into physics, okay, now they're discovering things in, in the universe that they never knew before. Like for example, transferring an atom from one place to another place, okay? They, they thought this was impossible. Without you physically moving it or something moving it from one place to another place, they thought it was impossible. Now they're discovering over the black hole and with what happens, again, it's only the beginning of their discoveries. There's a lot more to discover. They're discovering things that defy the whole of physics. The whole of physics and how what we believe or what, what it is, what gravity is and not is, the whole of that is being turned, the whole of that is being turned over right now because of the new discoveries they've got in space about the black holes and so on. And it's something that's defying their entire logic. They don't, they just don't know how to explain any of this. And that's what I'm going to say to you right now is that when it comes to God and understanding the nature of God, it is beyond us. And you might say to me, well, well no, no, we still need to understand this. But let me, let me give it, a, a, a scholar gave a wonderful example. If I give you right now one kg to lift, will you be able to lift it? Yes. If I give you 10 kg, will you be able to lift it? Yes. If I give you 100 kg, will you be able to lift it? Now, some humans here will be, you know, some muscular guys is probably guys in that. And by the so, some guys will be able to lift a hundred kg. Fine, now they're going to branch and uh, lift it. But you tell me, if I gave you a thousand kg to any man in the world, will he be able to lift it? If I gave ten thousand kg to any man on his own, would be able to lift it? No, it's impossible, right? Now that's the limit in our muscle. If I told you with your 2020 eyesight, are you able to see this thing on the wall? It's like a yes. If I gave you 2020 eyesight and said on a clear day, can you see, let's say, for example, the, the Gherkin, whatever, the building, can you see that? You say, yes, I can see that. If I gave you 2020 eyesight and I said to you, can you see Scotland from here? <laughs> and he says, Scotland? No, you can't. It's impossible. Impossible for any human being on the clearest day to see Scotland from even see Birmingham or even see Luton from here. You can't. Okay? It's just our eyesight doesn't reach there. Hearing is also limited. Our feeling is limited, our taste is limited, our smelling is limited. Dogs can smell a lot better than us, right? It's limited. Our brains are also limited. We can't understand certain concepts. They're just beyond us. And one of those concepts is to understand the nature of God. It's beyond the human being. The, only, the best way we can get close to Allah of understanding Him is the Quran. And that's the, that Allah says, well, this much, I know you can understand. Even, I'll give you another example, yeah? Even Jannah, we would never be able to understand Jannah. Even the fact that Allah said in the Holy Quran that there's grapes in Jannah, you know, Allah said in the Holy Quran, grapes in Jannah. Jannah will have grapes, but there'll be nothing like the grapes of this earth. You guys understand, you don't understand. We're thinking of green grapes, black grapes, nice and sweet, looks nice, like an oval shape, and we're going blah, 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 and it's nice and sweet, that's what we think of. Sorry, you're wrong. Because Allah's Messenger said, مَا لَا عَيْنُ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُدُنْ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرْ Jannah has things that no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard of, and no heart can ever think of. So if you have seen grapes, are those are the grapes of Jannah, if you have if you have thought of it, then it can't, it can't be from Jannah. And the more better thing about that is, even the women of Jannah are not going to be like the women of this world, you know what I'm saying? Right? You know what I'm saying? Right? And even the men of Jannah are not going to be the same as the men in this world. We're going to be totally different creation. It's in the Hadith. We're going to be totally transformed into a new creation that none of us ever know what that creation is, and then we go to Jannah. So this, we can't even understand Jannah. So when Allah, you know, my father have said this, okay, my, my teacher, he said, for Allah now to use the terms of the real Jannah, he could not reveal it in the Quran because none of us would understand it. Do you, do you, do you know what I'm saying? So therefore, he used things that are similar to the things we have in this world. So he said, you're going to have grapes. 
which means that I will make sure that they have the name of a grape or grapes. There will be something similar to what you have, but they're not going to be what you what you got. Allah said you're going to get date palms in Jannah. So they're not going to be anything like the date palms in this in, on this earth. Allah said you're going to have gardens green, nothing like the greenness we've seen on this earth, and nothing like the gardens we've seen on this earth. Allah said water. He said wine. He said milk. He said honey. He said rivers of it. Nothing like the kind. Not even the rivers are going to be the same. Everything will be totally different. They'll be much, they'll be way beyond our, our, our thinking. And if that's the case about Jannah, how are we supposed to understand Allah? It's limited, you can't. It's impossible. Anyway, thank you. Let's, let's have that as the last question, yeah? Although I've been here all night, it's been a wonderful evening with all of you. If you just stay where you are, there's a couple of announcements to be made, and then you could you can leave, inshallah. Just stay there for 30 seconds, inshallah. Now, just a quick question from our chairman, actually. Zakallah for everybody, giving us time to speak with the Sheikh. As you can see, very inspiring talk, Alhamdulillah. We want the Sheikh, inshallah, to come back again and give us another speech, inshallah. And I think sisters enjoyed it as well.